Hi guys, welcome back. Um, we'll give you guys, I will give you guys an overview today of networks at a high level and some of the issues that um, we'll be concerned with in this course further down the line. Okay, so networking primarily deals with the internet. And so what I want you guys to understand or to learn in this course is not everything about the internet because for that you will need a PhD or in fact multiple PhDs, certifications and how to deploy networks and all kinds of other stuff. But what I want you to understand is the guiding principles behind the design of the internet and how to make large systems of computers work together. Um, and that will give you a framework for understanding what is going on today, what has been happening in the internet in the past uh, oh, four decades now. Um, and how that applies to the design of future networks. So if we look at the internet at a high level, um, it's fragmented into different subnets that do different things or provide connectivity for um, different types of devices. So here at the top of the figure, we have mobile networks, which is probably likely your view of, the, of what the internet is. And so you have some towers that use a wireless link to transmit data from mobile devices to the tower and then from the tower, um, the data traverses to routers, maybe some global ISP, which has just a bunch of routers connected together, um, to another ISP and then eventually to whoever you wanna connect to. Hey, maybe at another home or in an enterprise network. So um, these networks basically grow organically and are connected together um, with different networking technologies. So here we have wireless, Maybe we have um, some copper in the home like Ethernet. Maybe we have then fiber connecting um, routers together on high speed links, but this could also be um, copper in some situations as well. Here we have an old picture that shows you either a cable network or um, a DSL connection over phone lines. And so there's a lot of different technologies, um, a lot of independent deployments that connect together and somehow magically for now work together to transmit data from one end to arbitrary other end in the network. Um, there come together all kinds of protocols to allow you to find other points in the network, um, to be able to transmit data in a reliable way. And those are all kinds of solutions that we will look at um, to a um, greater or lesser extent, depending on um, uh, kind of which technology we're talking about. Okay. So some interesting things that happen in connecting networks is that people go to great lengths to improve the performance of networks for their particular use cases. So here's an interesting study of connectivity between Chicago and New York that has been set up for high-speed trading. Basically, you have two um, trading cities or um, exchanges in New York, you have New York Stock Exchange, and then in Chicago, you have uh, primarily trading of commodities such as pork bellies and or grain or other meat or other stuff like that. And so if in New York, you can know what happened in Chicago earlier, you can start taking trades with information that other people don't have. So to enable this high-speed trading, at some point people developed a fiber network specifically to connect Chicago and New York. And then someone else figured out that, well, if we can deploy a shorter network, we'll get a faster connection. And then someone else figure out how to improve that further. And then this still wasn't enough. So what uh, these people did is deployed a bunch of towers kind of in the middle of nowhere that connect directly to each other. So instead of running fiber kind of where it's possible geographically in a terrestrial setting, you can set up these towers kind of anywhere in a more direct line, which will shave off 3.9 milliseconds and um, that will, um, improve your ability to, to uh, execute high-speed trades with information that no one else has. And so this type of improvement, these specialized deployments, specialized technology is present all through the networks as people try to optimize some part of it. Um, we've seen a lot of innovation from 3G to 4G to 5G. Um, we've seen a lot of innovation in enterprise networks. And so this technology continually evolves while adhering to some principles of design that we'll be discussing. All right, so what I like to start this course with is this exercise where I divide you guys into six groups, give you cards uh, or responsibilities for 
running different nodes in the network and then kind of make you guys come up with a network that works. And it's uh, super fun, proves challenging. And unfortunately, we cannot do it this way. I thought about doing like a live lecture, but it's gonna be, it would be too hard to connect the groups. So sadly, I'll just explain to you what happens, which I feel a little defeated because it's a little bit like explaining a joke. All right, so the way this activity works is that the first thing you guys have to figure out is what is the connectivity between the routers. So each group, there's a source, there's a destination, or in fact, two destinations, and there's some number of routers in the network, and each of them have some connectivity that I tell you that you have. So for example, source is, can only talk to router one, and router two can only talk to router one and destination one. And so from the point of view of each node in the network, it is not aware of the connectivity of the entire network, but it is aware of its local connectivity to nearby nodes. And so understanding this topology, or in fact, better yet, being able to run a network without the understanding of the whole end-to-end -end topology is something that the internet has to achieve. Okay, so going deeper into this exercise, what the task was is the source had to send some set of bits um, to destination D1. The source doesn't know where this destination is. The only thing the source knows is that it is connected to router one, okay? So now we have a set of routers and they all got their own instructions. So router one had to memorize four bits and then forward the data somewhere. Um, but router six then had to memorize six bits, okay? So right away we have a disagreement in um, the protocol. Right? So they haven't standardized it, so they're all kind of running their own thing, and then they need to negotiate how many bits actually form a packet. Basically, how many things I'm supposed to memorize before I forward data on. Right? And then I also throw a curveball where um, this router 2 has uh, memorizes four bits, so that's cool, but there's some software error on it or hardware error on it where um, it starts flipping bits, okay? and then it forwards the data. So that can happen. There are all kinds of errors in the network that are happening and we still need to achieve reliable end-to-end -end transmission um, in spite of um, all kinds of things that can happen in the middle. Okay? And then basically destinations have to check that um, data X source to one or that it's correct. It's just a simple check that I came up with for this exercise. Okay? So the problems that um, you or the previous classes, I guess, that ran this exercise had to solve is some of the problems that um, have to be solved in a network and those solutions are provided by or standardized through different protocols. So one of the problems is addressing or routing. So uh, the source knows that it needs to send some data to destination D1, but it doesn't know where the destination is. Okay. It has already this address D1, which I guess kind of solves the problem of, of addressing in the sense that there is a way for the source to say, I want to send data to some specific destination and the specific part um, has to be identified in some way. Here we have D1 as the address of the destination, but um, in, as we'll see in networks at large, we use IP addresses, IPv4 addresses, IPv6 addresses. There used to be other addressing schemes as well. Um, and we need to basically be able to look at the network and assign unique addresses to each node. It's not clear how to do that without having understanding global connectivity of the network or understanding all, what all the nodes are such that we can give them unique addresses. Okay? So the problem of addressing is, is um, one of the things that networks solve. The other problem is routing, which is basically um, how to forward data to the destination. So um, a packet is sent from source to R1, and R1 now knows that, that the packet is for D1, but it doesn't know where to send it. Does it send it to R2? Does it send it to R3? R1 doesn't know the global connectivity. It only can make a choice between its, connect, its connected routers. Right? So R1 needs some information of what is a possible path to destination one or what is the best path to destination one. To know that there has to be some protocol that, you know, at the very least provides different path options or um, hopefully provides you with different path options and some metric for comparing which one is better. Okay. Um, 
So another problem that happened is that R1 and R3 didn't agree on the number of bits in a packet. Um, R1 wants to forward four bits, but R3 waits for six bits before it does anything. Okay, so um, those routers need to agree on what actually constitutes a packet. Um, it, there needs to be some standard because R1 and R3 could be ran by different organizations, could be made by different manufacturers. And so there needs to be some overall guidance of um, what makes a packet and how long do we wait until we close the packet up or what is the signal that some set of transmitted bit is, is finished and now we can forward those bits on. Okay. And then you have this R2 problem where, or the problem at R2 where there's something wrong with the router and it starts flipping bits. And so we need a mechanism such that destination, for example, if it's an end-to-end -end reliability mechanism, um, is able to detect the error and then request the correction. Okay? So if R2 dorked up the packet, then D1 doesn't get the correct packet and needs to, um, I don't know, maybe ask R2 for a better packet or maybe send a message back to the source saying, I did not get the packet I wanted, I can't decode the information. That's also not clear how to implement it um, or how to achieve that. And so we need some way for um, doing that, some protocol, standardized protocol, such that uh, the source and the destination can speak the same language, um, for example, to request a retransmission of data. And, and so all these types of problems are being solved in the network. So when we think of a large system, um, the unfortunate outcome of it is that it will lead to complexity. There are many different entities that exist in the system, many different manufacturers, many different network operators. Um, and you could say, well, we're just going to make a one uniform network with only one operator, only one type of hardware. Um, that's how the internet started in a sense. You could think of it that way to some degree. Um, AT&T kind of ran the early internet. And the problem is that it stifles innovation. There is, um, when you come up with one entity, that entity figures out how to make money and they're just happy kind of being a monopoly and making money and you don't get a lot of improvement. Um, that's sort of part of the reason why internet in, in Europe, for example, is much better in some ways because they have much more competition. Whereas, um, so for example, mobile networks are much better in Europe or in Asia than in America because there's sort of this uh, um, sort of monopoly of very few um, mobile providers and in fact, very few internet providers. Like I still cannot get uh, fiber in my house. Um, so we do want different entities. They enable competition, they enable growth, but they still need ways of talking with each other and coordinating. Um, there's also many different devices, different types of network devices, different types of networking technologies. They all need to um, talk together. Um, and then you have different type of functionality. This is going back to the different functionality that has to be provided for the network to work, such as addressing, routing, medium access, standards, etc., etc., and to reliability. Um, and so it is difficult to come up with one final protocol for the internet um, and instead, we uh, de designed that functionality in layers such that um, uh, we can improve different parts of the functionality without um, improving everything all at once. Okay. So to deal with different entities, um, the way they kind of interact with each other is through standards. There's a number of standardizing bodies such as ITF, W3C for wireless stuff. This is for internet protocols. Um, this is for kind of mobile uh, uh, computing and, and web stuff. And this is IEEE, which is for, um, uh, so this is the World Wide Web Consortium, which is for um, sort of application layer protocols and IEEE is for wireless, um, in fact, and um, well, primarily wireless, like Wi-Fi, um, 3G is kind of standardized by somebody else. But um, anyway, there's a bunch of these standardization bodies. One interesting thing about ITF is that um, people who work on the internet can uh, go and vote on the different changes. And by people who work on the internet, um, those are different 
companies like Google, um, Akamai, which we'll come and talk to, there. it's a big player, Cisco that makes a lot of the networking hardware, and representatives from those companies or researchers, in fact, if they want to, it's an open group, can go and debate different issues and then vote. And the way that uh, voting used to work, I'm not sure if it still works that way, but the way it used to work is that there would be some proposal in a kind of a live conference, like people would be in the same room, and you know, there would be a vote. Do we define this? Do we make this change to this protocol this way or that way? And the way people would vote is basically by humming. So there would be this hum, like, mm, and by the volume of the hum, you could uh, kind of decide the vote. So this was sort of like a semi-anonymous um, voting thing. And if there was no agreement, then the debate would go on, etc., etc. So kind of a quaint a quaint body but it still works and it still makes all the decisions about what happens mm, in the internet as far as the protocols okay um, so as far as devices there's delegation of functionality um, all the devices don't have to do diff everything they can implement different parts of the protocols um, and achieve things like end-to-end -end reliability and hub by hub reliability which work together to make sure the data gets from one end to another correctly. And that's basically the end-to-end -end mechanism. And that that happens efficiently, which is hub by hub mechanisms of basically retransmission of data among neighboring nodes. We'll get into that a little bit later as well. And then you can divide functionality of the internet into modular design, as I mentioned. And the way that is um, that has been organized is through the open system interconnect or the OSI stack, which I will discuss in a second. Yeah, but just to give you guys an introduction into or an intuition about how this works. So let's say that I want to order a book from Amazon that one of my college buddies has written. Um, and it needs to go from Amazon. Um, initially, this is Amazon's initial logo. How they build a company on that logo, I don't know. Um, to Montana State University, which I like that M better than the current one, personally. Okay, so I want to order that book. And so... I need to give Amazon the address of where this is going to be shipped. So this is my address at school. And um, this is what I sent to Amazon. Okay, this is my endpoint. Now, Amazon sends this book to, let's say, through the postal service. And the postal service doesn't really care who this is going to. They really care about where it's going to. And the where is decided by the uh, kind of geographic location defined by city and zip code and maybe the address of the maybe the building right this basically identifies the building but really they just send data to Montana State uh, data they send a package to Montana State University where we have our own mail service which then looks at the actual building that this book has to go to and the name of the of me and so different parts in this network of mail delivery are concerned with location information or operate on different information to do what they need to do. And this is this kind of modular design of um, our mail delivery system based on addresses. Okay, so let's make this um, a little bit more network related um, and talk about the internet protocol stack or the OSI stack. So, what we have is devices connected to each other through a network. We have two cell phones, they talk to cell phone towers, and then the cell phone towers talk to a router or in fact a network of routers. I just have one router here. Okay, and so what happens here? Let's say that we wanna send a Snapchat message from application running on this phone to an application running on that phone. Okay? You can think of the application layer, which is layer seven, um, as supporting services, the service in this case is an application. Application is more like a software definition, but from network perspective, it's a service. And what is being sent between application endpoints are messages. Okay? So these are um, just basically application layer messages of here's the text I want to send and whatever other information is included. Um, by the application for that message to be received correctly. And so you can also describe it as data, okay? Now, what happens is when this phone or a network device and device, host device, um, 
sends a message that message doesn't go out directly it is get, it gets forwarded to the operating system um, via a socket so there's a transport socket either a tcp or a udp socket that handles the transmission of data okay so what the transport layer provides primarily is end-to-end -end communications okay this transport layer will be talking using tcp or udp to another transport layer which is an implementation of the same protocol Okay, so now we have standardization where different phones will be implementing the same protocol and here we'll be sending uh, segments of data okay? just another name um, and so a message might be big the message could be i don't know a, a video or a large um, picture and it gets partitioned into small segments which when they all are received um, transport layer puts together the message and then forwards the message up to the application layer so it can be implemented um, interpreted by the application okay. um, and let's say if data is lost um, transport layer will request retransmission and provide end-to-end -end reliability such that all the different segments can get here message can be reconstructed as it was passed from the application layer here that message is reconstructed here and then forwarded to the application okay but the transport layer doesn't actually send data directly either on your network um, in fact it passes this to the network layer um, which needs to figure out things like addressing and routing okay so um, this is handled by the ip uh, protocol and basically now packets or datagrams are forwarded from one network device to another network device so here from the phone to the cell tower and then from the cell tower to the router and then those devices need to figure out where to forward the data on one path such that it eventually gets to um, this cell phone tower okay so we have addressing and routing supported by the network layer primarily okay and i should have mentioned that for each protocol each protocol adds its own information um, to be able to uh, for other devices to make decisions about the data being transmitted so for data being sent at the application layer tcp will add its information for example a port number some other information such that um, this transport layer receiving this segment can interpret what's going on now when this tcp segment is forwarded to the network layer the network layer adds its own information such as sender's ip address and destination ip address and based on that information devices and network can figure out where to forward the data on one path okay then the network layer sends the packet to the data link layer which um, is for example gsm or 5g or wi-fi or um, ethernet and the network layer uh, sorry the data link layer is responsible for figuring out how to actually transmit data from here to here or on any individual link okay so some things that need to be solved at the network uh, at the data link layer excuse me is things like medium access if we're talking about wi-fi we need to decide who gets to speak at any given point right as people we do that naturally we have mechanisms for um, kind of negotiating through social cues who gets to speak at any given time um, and so this is basically what medium access is, is there needs to be some method for nodes to take turns or speak on different frequencies or somehow reuse the medium such that they don't um, clubber each other's transmissions. There are also reliable, reliability mechanisms to make sure that um, data being transmitted from one device to another over a link actually gets there, that the, that the frame being sent by the data link actually gets there and you will also be familiar with this in um in speech where you know maybe i'm saying something to you guys or in a conversation and someone is saying mm -hmm, aha yes whatever right that gives me cues that they are receiving my communication and are absorbing it right it's actually very difficult to um, talk for a while without getting any sort of feedback especially over the phone if you don't hear someone saying those social cues back you're going to wonder if the connection is still live like right now i'm wondering if my computer is still recording i hope it is but i'm always a little bit worried um okay so that's the data link layer and now to do the actual transmission the frame 
is passed to the physical layer for modulation. And so this will be handled by a network card, which maybe generates the Wi-Fi signal, the electromagnetic signal to, to transmit um, over Wi-Fi, or generates electrical signals to transmit something over Ethernet. Okay? And here we are transmitting symbols. Each symbol will represent some number of bits in a frame. Um, and so basically through interaction of these different layers, we are able to transmit data on hub by hub basis and then provide reliability on end to end basis such that applications can have this abstraction of just being able to send messages with each other without um, hopefully knowing anything that happens at layers below. Okay, so another question that comes up is how does the internet grow? How to create a very large network? Okay, so um, you can think of the network is being built from some, of, some number of nodes that want to communicate and now the question is how to physically connect them. Okay? So we can think of connecting them for best end-to-end -end performance. What would that look like? If you just wanted those nodes to have as much bandwidth or as um, basically as good a connectivity as they can, as they can have, what would be your solution here? Um, what we usually come up with is connecting them on all, all to all basis. So we can connect this node to this node. Um, we can connect the same node to this node. This is not working here very well, sorry. Okay. Um, and we can connect this node to this node and basically connect every node to every other node using these direct links. Now, this is problematic, of course, because it's very expensive. So if we have millions of nodes in the internet, um, each node would have millions of connections. The network would basically start looking like this, um, like this bird nest of wires. So this, is, this doesn't scale. So <clears throat> what could we do to basically lower the cost of connectivity? Well, maybe we have, um, so can I change the color of this? Cause that'd be great. Maybe we have two nodes that connected with each other. Okay, great. Let's do red, perfect. Okay, maybe we have nodes, two nodes that connected to each other, that's our initial network. And then we're gonna create another node, add another node to this network and connect it as well. Okay, cool. And then we add another node, which maybe goes from here all the way to here. Okay, so it's easy to connect additional nodes, you basically take a node and connect it to some other node, maybe if you're clever on the shortest path, but depending on the order of the way things are added, right, maybe this isn't the best type of network that happens because now, you know, maybe we have sort of this type of connectivity, right, or I guess if we're going to go by closest, maybe something like this, right, and so this growth is really not planned, there could be all kinds of bottlenecks where maybe now everyone tries to connect talk through this node, there's a lot of traffic on this node, it has sort of three connections where all the other nodes have two, co have two connections um, or one connection even. Um, and so this doesn't really scale either. So what can we do? Well, we can start creating some crosslinks to, to improve this connectivity, right? So let's say that now we're gonna add a link here and create a cycle, okay? so for this node to communicate with this node, it doesn't need to go all the way here and then back here with its data. It has a more direct link, okay? But now we have um, loops in the network. We have cycles and we need some routing, some protocols to make sure that our packet doesn't kind of end up just going in a circle for, for some reason, okay? Um, but then we may be a little bit more clever and try to kind of create regional growth in this network, provide a regional ISP. And for that, we may want to create a regional exchange point. So basically a set of routers that is going to serve a particular network. Okay. So now all these nodes here in this region can start connecting with this exchange point. Away. 
Okay, one more, so it's pretty. Okay, so pretty. Um, right, and now connectivity can be provided to um, the rest of the network, maybe through another exchange point um, with connectivity between them. Okay, and one more. Okay, now we have the networks sort of connected. Great. Okay, so instead of just connecting nodes, we can start building our network infrastructure and we can improve this network infrastructure by creating high speed or high capacity links. Okay, that carry that have the capacity to carry all the data from one local network um, or regional ISP to another regional ISP. Right? Um, this also depends on how much traffic is being exchanged, right? It could be that there's a lot of flow going on in particular from one region to another, maybe from New York to Chicago. And so we need to provide specialized high capacity links to, to handle that. So it's not just, the, not just making sure that everyone's connected, but also making sure that depending on how much data they're sending to each other, there is enough capacity in this network. You can think of an analogy as a kind of a road network where you know, if you have a large city such as New York and just local streets, um, it's very difficult to, those will become congested very quickly. But if you add high capacity paths or highways or tunnels, um, you're able to carry the traffic more effectively. Okay, so the way this works, the way this looks in practice is something like this. This is a picture of the internet or visualization of the internet from, I think, 2011. And you clearly see these local ISPs um, that are providing local connectivity or sort of a regional ISP that's providing connectivity. And then you also see these high speed links that are providing kind of cross connectivity within the internet. So if you looked at this at the architectural level, you have these access ISPs, maybe, you know, Charter, whatever, in Bozeman, right, which connect to regional ISP. And this could be something like Blackfoot Communications out of Missoula, right? And they connect to other regional ISPs or these internet exchange points that I mentioned and have connectivity to tier one ISPs, which don't actually, um, maybe they don't even have any end customers. Their job is to just run, um, to have routers and to have um, high capacity links between cities or between continents. Right? And they provide this uh, long range connectivity to regional ISPs, which then have kind of customers in the, on the edge of the network. Right? And then content providers such as Google or Akamai can also enter the network and have good connectivity to tier one ISPs to serve their content to people at the edge of the network who want, who want it. So here's a view of uh, level three, um, which got bought by CenturyLink a couple years ago. Um, but um, anyway, this is what the level three network looked like at the time. And so level three provides connectivity between cities. You can see their kind of terrestrial network here, as well as uh, fiber, um, underwater fiber cables to connect continents. Right? And so here's the transatlantic cables, here's cables to Asia, and here's kind of cables throughout America, which go around the continent because it's much cheaper to put them down that way than to actually build a uh, terrestrial network over land. Right? These cables can be, can be much faster and in fact cheaper to maintain. Okay? And then at each point here, this ISP will provide a PUP or a point of presence, which has routers that connect it to these long range um, cables. And then these routers are also connected to other routers, which then provide connectivity to regional ISPs or local ISPs, or in some cases, big customers such as Google. They might be directly connected to this tier one ISP. Okay. So I think, yes, I think that is um, the high level overview of how the internet is built. And from now on, we will start looking at the protocols, starting at the application layer and then slowly working our way down into transport network data link and physical as well. Um, let me know if there are any questions. Um, otherwise, um, I will see you guys on Friday. All right, thanks.